really good speaker. He won't thank, he won't thank me for saying it, but um, I first saw him last year in uh, Stockport at Freedom North West meeting. I remember him. He's this weird looking fella, here, buddy. <laughs> but, but, I've never heard anyone speak that lasted for about an hour and a half, but it seemed like 10 minutes. It was, uh, I thought we've got to get him at one of our meetings, and finally we've nailed him down and we've got him tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Darren Dioji. Thank you for the introduction. I said I'm coming to see you guys again. Uh, so I'm glad to you to make it. It's so funny because whenever you do an introduction like that, it always just eliminates everything that I've scribbled down with my notepad that I wanted to say. Sorry. And it changes it all. No, it's absolutely fine. Um, and I always think it's questionable whether it's good having these things in a pub. Just because of the pint fact of the speaker. So, excuse me. <laughs> well, I'm trying to do this evening justice. Um, Good evening, my name is Darren Dioji, as he said, everything about my appearance is part of a psychological experiment, um, very, very interesting, the results have been very, see my passport photo from 10 years ago, I was uh, just a little bit less bold than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, um, I do a lot of different events, I haven't done them for a while because we've got a young baby at home and that's taken up a lot of my time for the last year, but I've been doing my own events for about six or seven years about really unusual subjects um, that people don't really give credit for. They're not aware of how much awareness is buried in them. So I do stuff on language, on gender, on perception, on things that we use every single day without even giving it much credit, without realising how, how much it affects everything about us, everything that we understand about ourselves. And this kind of... Uh, took me down a, a whole range of different channels, one of them being this whole free man sort of sovereign movement and where I was showing how powerful language is at play all the time and uh, I chucked a few ideas into the pot and it kind of kicked off and I get invited to speak at things like this. So has anybody here heard of the People's Public Trust? Mm -hmm. An idea, yeah. So that's one of my initiatives which is um, about the everyday language of our interaction with public servants. A lot of problems that people are experiencing just now, Norman Scarf is one example that you mentioned earlier. A lot of people are having problems with the state, they're having problems with feeling that, um, they're feeling a bit oppressed, a bit squeezed, that money's being milked from them, um, that they're maybe not being very well represented, and obviously that's a huge understatement compared to how many people view what's going on in the world just now. Um, and I've, you know, kind of eked out this people's public trust idea as one solution that we can all use to bring about some real change. I mean, this is called We Are Change, isn't it? And it's like, well, okay, well, how do we bring about change? And uh, I have to say that everything that we've tried up until now hasn't worked, has it? Because we've not really all brought the change that we've wanted. And as we move into this quite incredible year, I thought that for the first talk, I wanted to mention a bit about what change is and how we can affect it and how um, we can be much more effective this year as individuals with our own sort of contribution to make. I think it's a really important thing for us to take ownership of that. Um, so one of my things is people's public trust. Please do have a look at it. I'll talk about it a bit more as we go through the night, but I wanted to make a mention about effectiveness because um, we had a representative at the Norman Scarf uh, case, but we've also had representatives at some other cases just observing that the principle is that we are using is that public servants are entrusted with having the well-being of the community as their highest priority. And then we just ask if anybody disagrees. Nobody ever disagrees, because it's obvious. Uh, now what's interesting though is that that very, very powerful statement um, performs an interesting trick, because it suddenly says that our relationship with our public servants is one that's based on trust, not necessarily on contract, which is where a lot of people are playing things. Now one of the issues with contract, I know it's maybe a little bit technical for those of you that haven't looked at contract and sovereign stuff, but um, contract is one of the biggest problems that we have in the world because it's all about limited liability in a contract. And limited liability is diminished responsibility. Diminished responsibility is someone that doesn't take responsibility and can get away with doing things that they shouldn't really be able to. And I'm really up for getting rid of limited liability and diminished responsibility because we really are all liable. Now what's really interesting is that by using this concept of the people's public trust, we're saying that the relationship is trust-based first. And the very funny thing is that trust law is different from contract law. And in trust law, there is no limited liability. It's not there. Everybody is holding completely liable. And so if we can prove and express the fact that the first relationship 
that our servants have in relation to us is one of is trust based, then all of a sudden we've eliminated, eliminated our limited liability and we get that and move upon them. And that's what we've been experimenting with in the last couple of years. And it's all been, um, I'll give a little bit of background, I didn't want to do this today, but because only a few of you have heard of the public trust, I just want to mention a very fundamental thing about um, this power language I was talking about. So I go about how we spell all our words because all our words are spells. One of the subjects in the header today, what was it called? Something about spells, control, freedom, something like that. And um, I'm going to talk more about spells as we go through the evening because it's a very significant thing. Because, um, you know, what's a spell? It's a word or phrase of magical effect. And really, all words have magical effect. In if you all think about things that have been said to you in relationships, or in the playground, or with parents, or with kids, and how it can make you feel, how it can make you treat yourself, or think about yourself, or punish yourself, and how that can last for anything from moments to decades. And I can guarantee you right now that every single one of you is censoring yourself, punishing yourself, and abusing yourself as a result of things that somebody has said to you. Guarantee it. Put money on it right now. So, in some way or another, and I'll explain more about that as we go on tonight, because we're going to talk a lot about the concept of sovereignty and how it relates to actually what's going on in our heads. And it's very much about our attitude to ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, how we treat ourselves, and all the rest of it. And really, so much of our world and everything that we assume is based on words and what they mean. But my work is about showing how the words don't really mean what we think they mean. So for example, the first example I've been doing for many, many years that would get people's attention is the concept of corporate slave, you know, enslavement um, of humanity and how people think, well, you know, where's the evidence for that? I mean, a lot of you guys will obviously have accepted that as a fact, but, you know, not everybody does and you might not be able to talk to your mum about it. But, you know, you can go back to your mum and talk about what people have to wear when they go to work, and you can say, well, mum, what do they call this part here around the guy's neck? What's it called? And your mum will say, collar. And you ask her, well, mum, what's the part around his wrists called? What's that? The cuffs. And what does he put in his collar, mum? What's that that he, you know, ties up? What do they call it? A tie, okay, mum. Who else wears collar cuffs in a tie? It was made of metal. Would you understand it? Any in a fashion. And our whole society is one of a collar-based access system of blue collar, white collar, dog collar, or your person known by the collar number. And we have our infantry who have their dog tags, which is their form of what they wear in their collar. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a graded collar system. And I'm not making that up. And that's not a conspiracy, is it? You know what I mean? These are the symbols. I don't have to explain any of those symbols to you. Every single one of you know what they are. And all I've done is repointed that spell to mean something else. And all of a sudden, it, you know, everything changes, isn't it? And this is the power of language and how it can be used to enlighten, uplift, guide, instruct, but how it can also be used to control and mislead and detain and contain. And one of the issues, the issues that we're all up against is the result of containment efforts against us from our birth. And I don't mean it as some kind of, I don't, it's not personal, it's not like you're being picked on, it's just part of our societal structure as such that these things are just there and we all have to learn to deal with it. And some of my work is very much about getting into all of that. So the People's Public Trust was one example of that where it was a social application where I would just turn up a coat with a badge and a clipboard and say master had observer on it and just sit there and to watch people's behaviour change and how they responded and how the ripples would go through the coat but I was a master observer here from some people's public trust and over the years we've tried it in a number of situations and it's amazing we've had judges walk out and um, we had a guy just the other day, just last week, in a family court, the so-called closed private family courts, we managed to get a public, public trust observer in there because we're observing the due process that the, the people of the United Kingdom are entitled to. Um, it's not a confrontational thing, it's purely an observation process. And it's quite a mechanics. They introduce an observer into the scene and everything changes. And basically we're operating from a pure point of mechanics consciousness point of view. There's nothing confrontational or threatening about it. And it's really interesting what happens. And last week, a young a man got to go home with his daughter for the first time in seven years. And they listed an order on it just from having an observer. And the observer didn't get to stay in for the, 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 the whole case. 
But the fact that they knew fine well that the new word of what was going on there would be getting, be getting fed back. And the People's Public Trust is something that everybody can get involved in. Whatever issues we've got, working teams, you know, we've got working groups set up on, um, and they're only just getting started, so you'd be really in at the beginning if you want to get involved. But working groups on council tax, on the um, bank bailout, on misrepresentation, or a breach of trust, um, on, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we can play with with the public trust as a really powerful tool to help us reassert ourselves in relation to our paid and employed servants who don't seem to be serving us anymore. And this is where it all boils down to, so some more about the power language stuff for you is that anybody here into the free man sovereign movement? Anybody here, is everybody not, anybody not heard of it? I've not heard of it, that's absolutely fine, it's okay. Because I'm not really, you know, it's a really interesting movement, but you know, there's lots of kind of uh, rabbit holes that people get lost down it because it's all about understanding the law and how. How can anybody tell us what to do? You know, if we are all sort of like divinely mandated beings that are all equal, then, you know, how can someone enforce something upon you? And this is what body of law is all about. And uh, the whole sort of sovereign movement is about realising that law and state structures are by consent. Because if they're not by consent, and they're not consent based, then what are they? They're slaveries or dictatorships. If it's not consent based, then if it's not by your consent, then what are you? And it's a really, really simple, powerful point. And so, well, okay, and, and the sovereign movement has been virtually, and metaphorically, asking that question in practice, as it were, in a number of different scenes. And um, it can get very confrontational and very heated. Many people have lost their liberty over it, and it's been, you know, a lot of people are their homes and, you know, getting into a lot of financial trouble and all this sort of stuff. And it's just because of their, their pioneers exploring a whole new area. But um, again, I wanted to, didn't want to get into all of that. I wanted to say, well, look, look at the words we use every day. You're just not paying attention to what's staring us in the face. And the way in which, the, the problem that we have with the state, just to summarise it, is that they are meant to be our employees, and yet we somehow end up behaving like the employees. You know, we are at their beck and call. We then have to pay when they demand. We need to take whatever they want from our wage, all the rest of it. We don't have a say in it. So uh, who's working for who? You know, now. That would be fine if you were enjoying the quality of service that you might like in your community, so that your community was a happy and safe and progressive place to be. But that doesn't seem to be what your money is buying, is it? Well, you seem to be buying a bunch of psychotic, sociopathic warmongers to have free reign to do what they see fit upon people who can't really defend themselves. And I, you know, I for one, am really not up for that happening in my name anymore. And certainly as I have a young baby in the world and a young daughter in the world, I don't want to see her growing up in a progressive world that goes in that direction. And really this is all about us understanding about vision and about whose world you live in and whose world you're repeating in your head. And we're going to get more into that this evening a little bit as we go along because I want to talk about the, the issues of what you think about and you know your, your perspective on what's happening because it's absolutely essential. We really are all co-creators and you know what's going on inside your head is very, very important for all of us. And it's like, if you're thinking their thoughts, that's not really good for anybody. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail because of this whole spell, spelling thing. But in terms of how we fix this situation with public servants, the, what I realised was that, you know, everybody was missing the trick in terms of how the tables have been turned on us. And in this country, it's all about title. And so, actually, it was all about the title. I know some of you may have heard this before, so I'll very quickly get through it. So, you've been given a title. Mr. Mrs. Miss, it's not yours. You were given it. Okay? You don't know what it means, most of you don't. It doesn't turn up in most legal dictionaries, you've got to really, really hunt to track it down. And Mr. has its roots in the word mystery, as in M-I-S-T-E-R-Y, which was archaically mystery with a Y, M-Y-S-T-E-R-Y, as in it's a mystery. And um, a mystery is just defined in certain law, law dictionaries as just a business or a trade. So your Mr. is a business or a trade. Now that's not obviously you because you're a human being. And this is what they call the corporatization of the person. So this is where, you know, you live in a capitalist world, that's why when you get a national insurance card, your letters are all in capitals, that's the first time you're probably referred to as a mister, or a, a miss formally sort of thing. But what's interesting is that, again the language of it, misses and miss aren't actually words. You look at misses, it's moors, isn't it? So what, where, where's the word there, why do we say misses? And it's a, because it's missing an apostrophe. And it's actually misters, I mean, belonging to the business. 
Mrs. Uh, Mr. is a glow for the business. And Miss, I want you to picture the form, ladies, where you have title, forename, surname. And under title, you put Miss. It means miss this. It means skip this. There's no title. Hey, you've got no title. So, when women fought for equal rights, they fought for the vote, they fought for the right to work, all the rest of it, title never caught up. It never really got so when women went through the whole of the war, war era realising, you know, well, it's a man's world, blah, 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 title agreed. It still did agree. But what's interesting is that that's not your actual natural title in this country. Because what was the title we all enjoyed as boys? And that was that when you, were, when you had that title, you were not subject to statutory obligations, you were not subject to tax, you were only subject to the common law of the land, which was the law of injury. And otherwise, you were free to enjoy your full private powers. And that is the title master. And the title master turns up in every legal dictionary in the world. And it's all about being the employer, the principal, the creditor, the one who has control of the conduct of another who is engaged in services towards them. And that is our natural title in relation to our public servants. Oh my goodness me, no surprise, it's all in the title, it's all there. So again, this isn't a conspiracy, is it? All I'm doing is telling you stuff that you've known your whole life. It's just putting it into a pattern that you actually said, ah, well actually that makes a lot of sense. And it is because that is the truth of things. The truth of things are that we are the creditors, we are the employers, all the rest of it. And in fact, it goes beyond that though, because there's no us in them where we can go, yeah, yeah, you're my servant, blah, blah, blah do what you're told sort of thing, because really, we're all servants at some point. If we're working, if we're serving in some way or another, we're always having to be in a situation where we give to them. So actually, we're all what you call mutual beneficiaries in a trust, which is the enjoyment of our community and making the community a nice place to be. Now, I think this is something we all need to sort of get into our heads for when we're tackling the issues of dealing with the public servants that we're up against. Because I've been in this game for a few years and, you know, been involved in the issues of people who are obsessed with their authority and they're obsessed with their power or they've been in there for 40 years and they're, you know, I'm not going to pull any punches in this year of incredible change and that is we're dealing with people who are actually a bit mentally ill. You know, no, really, 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 I mean, I mean it. And I'm going to talk about mental illness as being an endemic problem that we have because of the abuse that we all engage in against ourselves, you know. And, you know, we really do kind of gloss over the fact that of, of how um, much mental baggage we all have to deal with and how damaging our culture has become mentally for us all. And that's why we have so much vice and so much depression and so much upset. And the funny thing is, in this 21st century, we should be feeling at our most empowered and our most full of joy and love of ourselves and each other. And yet, why does it seem to be the opposite? That people seem to be at a low. So wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't the evolutionary direction. <laughs> this isn't, you know, what I'm, what I'm feeling inside and know what it should be. So why is it, what's going on here and how can we get into it and turn it around? Bizarrely, that's what we're trying to plug into the public trust is actually, we're making actually a grounded social application of some very, very, you know, spiritual and inclusive community-based ideals. And it's about put, making it very simple with simple everyday language. It's about trust. You know, and it's about, well, okay, you fulfilling your part of the trust. And, you know, and are we, how are we going to go about dealing with the other ones who have also broken their part of the trust? And let's actually now start to address it. And just a few, the case examples that we've used, actually having observers there, it's been incredible. It's been absolutely incredible. It seems to evoke the human in people, and it's like, well, okay, that's what I want. Because what we're all suffering from is a lack of humanity in services and a lack of humanity and stuff. And so, okay, how do we re-inject that? Because we've got two, we've got two choices with corporations and business and the world and society as we know it. And that is we either have to kill it or we have to rehumanize it. One of the two. And it's like, well, actually, it's a bit of a hurdle to try and deconstruct thousands of years of, you know, social construction, which actually a lot of it's very beneficial to us. So let's not abandon that. But, you know, if we can rehumanize it, then that's what I'm all about. And I think this is definitely the year for it if we can, you know, bring our own humanity to things. And actually, finally I'm getting to something I scribbled in my notebook because it's a big, you know, it's a massive, a massively, massively important time for what is going on in every single one of your heads. 
because we live in times of incre incredible co-creation and incredible manifestation. And I mean, I've been saying it more and more throughout 2011, where I've just seen things turning up for people and convergences and beauty and magic happening all over the place in incredible ways. It's like, wow, we really need to be careful about what's going on in here, because some of it's turning up. It really is, within a few weeks. It used to be years, now it's a few weeks. And then over the mid-winter, the incredible mid-winter we just experienced, actually after I spoke to you guys last time, I've noticed it shift again. And I've seen it turn up in days and minutes for people. And it's not always positive stuff that they want, but in terms of the polarization of our issues and the kind of crystallization of the stuff that we have got to deal with, everybody is having it presented square like this right now. And I've never come across anybody who says, oh, yeah, you're wrong with that. And if you, if you don't feel that, then please do say so. But what I have seen is that there is, we live in times of incredible intensity in that respect. And I think the one way of uh, getting through it that I've noticed is actually diffusion, is actually realising that it's, everybody's got something going on for them just now in that respect. And just that knowledge can, can, can actually just make it dissipate. It's a really interesting thing. There's, there's the work of diffusion that I've really felt just kind of sums it up for me, but I don't know if that's a bit too abstract for some folk, but certainly, and, and, and that to me is actually what it seems to be, you know, that's what community is for me. You know, it's like, well actually it's not all on you, the, you know, we all, we, all, we all seem to be going through stuff sort of together even though it's different, so, you know, let's just take it easy on each other for a bit. There was a, an interesting, I saw a really interesting number of talks last year in 2012, which was, um, from an astronomical point of view, and they were talking about how astronomy had changed its understanding in terms of how planets and stuff worked. I know this seems like a bit off at a tangent, but I think it's very relevant with all the 2012 and stuff that's going on. And um, it was all about how, actually, this model that we've been presented of the solar system was completely flawed, where, you know, we're presented with the sun in the middle and the, the circles all around it, and it's because that doesn't actually exist, because that implies that the sun is in a fixed position. If the sun isn't in a fixed position, it's moving all the time through the galaxy, down the spiral arms, blah, 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 blah. And this is, in a way, astronomy becoming galactically aware, or a galactic form of consciousness there that's helping them understand how we are orientated. Now, what's interesting is that when you have the idea of a sun sitting in the middle with things going around it, there's a staticness to that. There's a reliability. There's a sort of continuity there that means we don't think about it anymore. Our world is built up on layers of perceptual reality that we are comfortable with and we're not aware of it so if I move this mug and this this paint around you're okay with that because it's okay for cups to move around but if these walls suddenly shifted and we were on a beach and somewhere like that you know you'd be very very disturbed and there's parts of your understanding of the world would be very disturbed and we have many layers of reality that sit on top of each other from okay we're all in you know the basement of a pub called Divine in a place called Manchester in a country called England or a planet called Earth in a solar system blah 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 and we have these layers of reality that are our comfort zone of orientation and when you change any of these big ones, everything sort of changes. And so it's really interesting that astronomy is stumbling upon this because they're realizing that the sun is not in a state. We have this concept of state, don't we? It ties back into our social understanding, yes, this concept of state. And it's like, well, actually, what they've learned is it's not static. And the sun is moving in a spiral through space like this, like a corkscrew. But what's happening with the planets is that they are not orbiting the sun as we traditionally understand it, but they're more like a shoal of fish they kind of move like this, in this sort of elliptical motion as the sun is moving through space. And it totally changes the concept of our whole sort of setup here. A, a sort of one of those middle levels of reality, as it were. But what's interesting with that is that it actually says and it proves that we're actually never in the same place twice. We are never in the same place twice. It's a complete illusion. So this stuff that's going on, this stuff that can be dredged up or, you know, presented to us may have nothing to do with all of the traditional stuff that we're familiar with. It could be other stuff. Because we're traveling through space that's filled with gases and influence and magnetism and energy and electricity and all sorts of stuff that messes with us. This is what the whole basis of astrology is all about, is the fact that, you know, these are massive electromagnetic beings and we're electromagnetic and they're billions of times bigger than you, so hey, guess who's going to get the going to get the, 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 the bow wave as they, as you would think, you know. And it's just all food for thought in terms of, real, you know, changing how we think about what is, you know, wh where we are and what, where we're at and what's going on and what's possible and what we are. 
because this is all part of this limitation that's been placed upon us. I mean, just the, just the, the very simple language of use with the, with you tonight, can that in itself could transform community as we understand it. It can transform the way we understand, you know, social interactions and, and, and public services, and that's what we're trying to do. Because it's beginning to look like the concept of a people's public trust as a third element in social structures could be the element that democracy has been missing to make it work. And that is just, well, actually, you just need a third element and then it's going to observe, because then the people can watch the people in the public trust public trust are watching the public servants and then the public servants are just sort of doing it and everybody's watching each other sort of thing. And it just seems to be quite an end. So please, just explore that. I'm rambling around about that's the danger of having me in a pub. Excuse me a moment, I'm going to check my notepads. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, change. I still don't know what to say, but I'm going to talk about change for a moment because there's this really interesting thing. We are change. Here it is. We are change. And I really think, are you? Do you know what change is? Change is tied in with the concept of currency and what is current. Okay, because what happens when you hand over your 20 quid note for something that's £17.99? What do you get back? Change. Do you? <coughs> Just a couple of bits of metal. Oh, yeah. What do you always get asked for on the street? Somebody. Spare change. Yeah, spare change. I've got loads of change, mate, but no currency. What do you want? <laughs> but no bits of metal. And this is something that is in a way being robbed from us, is the concept of how much control we have over change. Because our, our concept of change has been tied to consumerism now. So if we want to create change, then we go and buy something. And it's like, well, okay, here's your item plus the rest of the change. And it's like, there's no change here. And that's why we have a state. And the point is, we all have to understand why the state is there. Because we're all responsible for it. And we're all accountable for it. Because we all wanted it. And it's about our insecurity. And it's about the part of us that doesn't want change. The part of us that wants things to be reliable. And wants them to be comfortable and to be okay. And to not, you know, stress us out. And to not, you know, oh, this upheaval and, you know, this tension of this dynamic change every day sort of thing, you know. And it's like that was how... I think some of us have experienced the concept of change emotionally in this very harsh world that we live in, but that doesn't, that's not how, it has to, that's not how it has to be. You know, that's just one form of sort of change, and I think we have to surrender to what that change means. It's taking us to the very core of our sort of vulnerability, this concept of the fact that, you know, we don't want to think about that stuff. We don't, that's why we have layers of hierarchy and service and all that. We don't want to think about it. We just want to get on with what we want to do. But it's backfired on us because we've given too much away. Or too much has been taken. And we're in the position now of actually having to restore the balance of what's healthy in that. But it's not, it's, not, it's not a lost cause. And I think one of the problems that people... This is the problem of both normal media, mainstream media, and alternative media, is that both of them can have a, a dangerous side effect of making people feel powerless and making them feel worthless and helpless and that they can't actually do anything and they can't affect change and that's the biggest disaster there is because that is the epitome of spelling backfiring because there you, here you are, a, a divinely mandated, unique being of the universe dreamt forth by this, 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 this you know, incredible planetary <coughs> sphere and you know, you've come here, you arrive in a state of total self-empowerment and self-love and gung-ho and yeah, I'm here, let's get on with it you know, and what has happened? What's happened, you know? Where did it go? And it's the reality is it's not gone anywhere, but we just, you know, we just got to sort things out a bit and get a, get, you know, re re rediscover that sense of worth in your opinion, your contribution, because, it, you know, it, it's completely equal. This is, the, this is what people really don't understand is what equality is. I do this whole talk called Divided Unity, which is about the concept of divinity and how it is actually, the, the divinity is actually, um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's divided into, people think it's all about unity, but it's not, it's actually about division and unity, and division and unity coexisting quite harmoniously, because we're all in a state of division and unity at the moment, and it's, you know, this is actually what we want, you know, because actually unity is a bit sort of boring, you know, this is about individuality, and it's all having something different to bring to the mix, you know, it's, it's incredible. Um, and this concept of divided unity is that, you know, there's no hierarchy there, you're not, the sun's not more important than you are. You know, but you're not more important than, you know, all the sheep and whales. That sort of thing. 
where we are actually all equal in that respect. Well, where do we find our sense of worth within that and value? And there's nothing I want more than, not for me to give you guys all something to do, but for, you know, to be able to fire the vocational spirit within yourself to get back your own gung ho -ness. Because there's nothing that, I think one of the dangers of the sort of global agenda and the globalization and, you know, the problem with state and dealing with that insecurity where, you know, the, 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 so things like McDonald's are a massive, um, extension of our, our desire for that sort of reliability, isn't it? Where it's like, well, everywhere I go, I want to know I can have a particular thing, and it's just that going crazy and off the wall. Um, but it, you know, it, it, it was there for, for a particular yeah, sort of and it's, Yeah, because I think change is more abstract than people realise. I think that's the point. It's much more abstract. Yeah, it's, you know, and um, we're actually a lot less comfortable with it than we think. But I think we're a lot more capable of it than we think as well. And I really, really believe that in this incredible year of, uh, you know, things turning up in minutes, it's never been more important what is going on inside your head. And the more awakened you are, the more important it is that you are in control of what's going on in there. Because whose world do you live in? Whose vision is it? I mean, I said this last time I was here. I've said it a lot in the last six months because it's really hit home for me. Because, you know, 12 people in a room can't change the world. They can't manifest a a kind of a regime of, you know, global terror or whatever, you know. But what they need to do is they need to get billions of divinely mandated beings to think about that and agree that that is what is going to happen. And if that's what you say, oh, well, they're going to do this and they're going to do that, and oh, my goodness, you know, all their vision is this doom and horror and blah, blah, blah. Then please don't. And if you have, please stop. <laughs> that's all I can say. Just please, 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 really, really, really back right out of that track because that is not the gig you came here on. I'm willing to put money on that. I don't want to eat money. I'm willing to put, I want to put change on that. <laughs> In a new turn of phrase. Um, and we all have to claim that responsibility and accountability for co-creativity. And I think, yeah, globalization is a really interesting thing because I realize that um, spirals, you know, is it, people can come across spirals a lot, and, you know, and you read a lot about it and all the rest of it. So I do a lot about spiral stuff because um, they're in the heart of our language. And actually I do stuff about how language is true masonry and I'm not going to get into all of that today, honestly. You, just, you, do, you probably don't want to hear it. But, you do. Uh, yeah, you, you do. You, I guarantee you want to hear it, but not tonight. Um, but yeah, about how, about how we can decode alphabets and regain our full raw mental awareness and all that sort of stuff and to realise that actually the, 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 you know, these alphabets are, are a really interesting thing because of uh, their character and because of uh, the letters that are in them and what they facilitate for us and what they affect. Consciousness is a really significant thing. That's what all these spells are made up of. And look at the effect they have. There you are, this incredible, fully self-empowered, beautiful, manifest, you know, creation of the universe. And, you know, somebody managed to make you think that you were crap in some way or that you, you know, that your contribution may not have value or and any any of those sort of negative things are just such a, a contrary nonsense to reality that baffles me that we all got scuppered by it in some way. You know, that we've all in some way managed to feel that uh, we can't actually be the change you want to see in the world sort of thing. Because there's a big issue here. And I really want to, um, the biggest thread that hit me over midwinter was this concept of the authorities not listening. Okay, and I'm going to get a little bit abstract here, but it's quite important in terms of understanding what's going on inside of us. Because the authorities not listening. Now, out in the world we're seeing a lot of evidence of authorities supposedly not listening to the will of the people. But what you have to realise is that obviously we live in a, a macrocosmic, microcosmic, mirror-based sort of universe. So people are aware of that as an idea that there's, uh, you know, the same things happen in the macrocosm as they do in the microcosm. Yeah, are people familiar with the idea of that? Yeah. Man's the microcosm of the macrocosm. Okay. So actually, it's, there's not just two levels of that, though. It's not just macrocosm way up there and microcosm way down here. There's loads of levels in between. And actually, our species, the human species is actually a mirror of itself and so what we see in the world is actually a manifestation of aspects of self in our cultures and in our nations and they represent aspects of the human psyche and if you have a look at the behavior of nations like America and Britain and Europe and things like that they exhibit certain behaviors so you could consider America to be the expression of and the manifestation of maybe the uh, sort of the the epitome of the teen spirit of humans where it's like, you know, there's all this potential for, you know, great wonder and all the rest of it, but there's also that real belligerence and sort of arrogance and, you know, 
you tread on their toe, they want to annihilate you. You know, that's a very sort of masculine team sort of medical thing going on and if you look at each of the nations and each of the cultures they actually are all expressive of different aspects of self and it goes even further than that some of the ancient and some of the old esoteric texts we talk about how the different races of man were actually about exploring different energy centers or aspects people familiar with the chakras yeah so it's like that actually each of the races was to explore each of the chakras so actually it's a very controversial subject but it would talk about how um, the Aborigine and black man was all about the excellence of the physical and to explore the essence of survival in the manifest realm just ultimate on behalf of the rest of humanity. And the yellow and oriental races would explore the second chakra of emotions and emotional understanding and mastery and that is what they went out to seek to master. And that the Aryan race or the white race would be exploring the realm of the intellect or the mind and they would seek to master that on behalf of humanity. And each of the other races would aspect, you know, explore different ones. But the point is, it's really interesting when you look at that model because it looks like there's, there could be something in it. And I certainly put a lot of stock in it. Um, because it's very, very interesting to see how that plays out because what we see is actually that the Western culture, which is meant to um, exhibit what's called lower mind or concrete mind, in the text, that's why we build structures of concrete because it is an expression of concrete mind um, where we believe that our ideas are things. We believe that politics is a thing. We believe that law is a thing. We believe that morality is a thing. But they are not things. They're just ideas. Yeah, but we've made structures to represent these things. Now, the problem that we've got, uh, here you go, head busted wide open now. Um, the problem that we've got is that the, <laughs> the Western world is doing exactly what most people do inside their own head. And that is that your mind wants to make the rest of yourself like it. Your mind wants to dominate your emotions, it wants to dominate your body, it wants to dictate how things go, it wants to be in control of absolutely everything that goes on in your emotional, physical and spiritual makeup. It is the dictator. And the desire of the Western world to pave over the rest of the world and make McDonald's available everywhere and blah 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 is a direct expression of our mental imbalance. Does everybody get that? Full on, isn't it? So when people want to talk about be the change you want to see in the world, actually, you don't have to go anywhere, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to watch any TV shows, you don't have to pay attention to any news whatsoever. You can absolutely transform the world and end all the wars and all the rest of it by doing that within yourself. Because you are worth that much. You are that valuable. You really do have the casting vote. And we cannot do it without you. And it includes everybody out there as well. And when we talk about the authorities not listening, what that means is the little dictator inside you not listening and acting on all the stuff you've learned. And all the things you know you should be doing and saying. And all that sort of stuff. The authority within you is not listening to you. So why the bloody hell have you got the right to expect the authority out there to listen to you? If you won't even listen to yourself, then you've got no right to ask anybody else to listen to you. And what gets me is that we, we, we keep, I said this before, and it really gets me, and it's, it's something that's really niggled me, and I've heard it a lot in recent years where we talk about being at meets like this and big rooms full of people, and it's like, oh well, we're preaching to the converted here, but we need to go out and get more faces and blah, 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 and I'm not sure we do. I think we probably do have enough people already, but they all need to actually have their own authority within themselves listening, and then, boom, the change that we would see would be absolutely incredible. Because it's all about, when are you willing to be you? When? At what time of day? Is it between 7 and 9 at your yoga class? Is it only when you're having a pint with the lads? Do you save it when you're playing with your child because it's the only time you feel safe? Where is your humanity when you're walking down the street? Where is your humanity when you're standing in the queue at the supermarket? Where is your community spirit? And yet we're all woeing and, and you know, woe betiding at the, the fact that companies are turning on us and bankers are turning on us when in actual fact, that's what we're doing. We're all complicit in it. Every day we all make the decision whether we want to make the community a nice place to be or a hellish place to be. We all make that decision. And I, I only arrived at that conclusion after I realised I was exploring the concept of sovereignty. And it was like, you know, a lot of people, have, you know, the royal family gets a lot of stick and all the rest of it. But really, we have to realise that all the structures that we have were meant to be representations of things that we wanted and needed. 
So we had a police force because we needed and wanted somebody to deal with that aspect of the community. We had a fire service for that, an ambulance service for that. And, you know, monarchy was just an extension of that, as far as I'm concerned, which is to represent the soul or the unifying aspect. That was all they were meant to represent. Okay, that backfired with, you know, mad nut jobs and all the rest of it, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't change the fact that the symbol is something that we kept a hold of. What's the if you want to the change, you have to be the change. Yeah, you have to be the change. Oh, you've got no bloody right to ask anybody else. You've got no bloody right to expect. What, do you want to chill and, you know, wait until somebody else does it first? I hate that, they're waiting for somebody else to do it. I realised, and actually I got so annoyed about it last year, that I got to the stage where the last couple of talks I was doing, it was like, do you know what? If somebody wants to put their name on some representative acts, so we're looking at doing big representative actions for the People's Public Trust, you know, going after some big names and some big issues like, you know, undoing the bank bailout like Iceland did and stuff like that, you know, really, really big stuff. And I realised that if somebody wasn't, you know, people would say, oh yeah, put me down for it, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I was like, well actually, if you're not willing to go and tell five people and chuck a couple of quid at the pot, I don't want your name. I don't want it. If it's going to be your little private little thing, then I'm not interested, because that is not how we're going to change all this stuff. That's that's part of the problem. And um, yeah, it almost came back to me. Damn it, it was on its way there. Um, <laughs> I could feel it hovering on the outskirts, but then I was like, oh. and it went. My dad will come out and disappear. You know, I can't get a dream after it's gone. Anyway. Um, so, yes, global, I'm going to jump back to this globalisation thing. And I realised one of the big issues, that, yeah, in your mind, try to pave over the rest of you and all the rest of it. So, yeah, please, you know, I think this is a time of, you know, compassion, vulnerability. We have to, you know, for us to be able to stop asking for the state to take care of our vulnerable and insecure issues, we have to re-own them. And to realise that actually it's not our weakness, it's our greatest strength because it's what makes us human and it's what makes us stay human around others because of, you know, realising that we are very vulnerable, fragile beings and you know that's our structure should re reflect that and our behavior should reflect that and it's like you know if we keep that in mind it can be a, it can we have a break for a cigarette time. break yeah. break and then yeah. we'll go back for another round if you're not prep if not we'll stop for another round <laughs> 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 um, things will be abuse this evening despite the occasional lot of the threat um, uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time tonight, unless any of you have any questions or whatever, but I just want to chat more about this <clears throat> sort of idea of the sovereignty within yourself and what it means and, and uh, how important it is to me personally um, and to all of us, I believe, um, for this, you know, as I've already said, incredible year that I, that I believe that we're in. And, um, to me, it's one of the uh, problems that is reflected by this globalist agenda of making everything sort of the same as really, where um, I think it's just the, you know the, the the death of all the you know fun of variety basically. And I think that what happens in life. I had a bit of an experience. You know, I was talking about spirals a little bit earlier. I really like spirals. It's an interesting thing for me because um, a lot of my work is about the the character G and where it turns up in interesting places in language and in masonry and in places like that because the interesting thing about the capital letter G is that actually all our letters are shapes, all characters are shapes um, it's just that when we put them next to each other we make these words out of them but they're shapes and that's how they operate in our consciousness and the capital letter G is actually the heart of a spiral it is a really interesting character where it actually represents the balance of masculine and feminine energy in the universe and that's why spirals turn up all over the place it's because it's a circle that never completes itself because of the impact of the line which is the masculine and that's why we have these spirals all over the place and that's what's missing a lot in a lot of our culture is to do with the balance, the kind of balance between gender polarities that's why I do <coughs> some quite unusual work on gender and relationships if anyone's interested uh, I'll get details at the end because I'll, I'll be running to events. Um, so yeah, the character G is really significant. You know, what my work I do a lot of stuff about that particular character because of the Silent G series and stuff. But um, spirals are interesting because the Mayans loved the G, and actually it was one of their core characters. They believed the G was the gateway to cosmic consciousness. I discovered this out after I'd been working on the G for years, so it was quite a revelation to me. There's a book called Secrets of Mayan Science and Religion by a guy called Hun Bats Men. You can look up yourself, but the whole book is about the characters G, O, and T. Um, but it's interesting how throughout Mayan architecture and makeup and pageantry, you find this sort of square G shape that they use all over the place. And I think this ties very much in with the sort of astronomical stuff I was talking about earlier. But I wanted to mention spirals because 
I had this bit of an interesting insight into the sort of crap that hits us in life. And it's all about perspective. And it's all about these sort of bizarre spirals. So I'll give you an example. So from here, from the distance, from your current perspective, this is just a little notebook. But if you get up closer and if you kind of zoomed in a bit, you might find there's words in it and you might get the detail of what the words are and they might take you into a whole other sort of um, arena of thought and intensity and emotional sort of content and things like that, which is what happens when you will often switch on the TV or go into a book or, you know, or, or yeah, read a book or go to the shops or things like that. Any of these activities in life create this wealth of sort of stimulus for us. And what ha seems to happen is, for me, and I only realised this in the last sort of year or so, so you get my new, my new sort of consciousness research in a way, and it's, um, there seem to be these sort of two types of spirals that we all get into, and we're all involved in hundreds of them. And we have these kind of decreasing spirals of increasing intensity that we get thrust into. And these are these situations where we Aren't, aren't getting a grip of what's going on, we're not learning the lesson as it were. You know, we're not spotting what's going on and things just get more and more intense. You know, it's almost like we're getting closer and closer to the notebook and then the letters are giant and staring at us, you know, and no matter what it is in life, you know, we, we, we have this sort of um, increasing tension. And uh, in fact, that's going to be a better word. You know, let's go back to a more simple word to help you understand what I'm talking about. And that is the word attention. Okay. So actually, the Toltec used to say the most important thing there is in your life is your attention. Because at all times it is taken by something. So it's limited. 24 hours a day, at all times, something is taking your attention. And in that way, they viewed it as the most precious asset you have. Because what's in your attention? You know, Very, very important. So here's an interesting thing, because... Get back at Chris here. Empty. So... Um, if you focus on the packet of crisps, what happens to everything else in the room? It blurs, out. It blurs out. So how important is the rest of the stuff? Not very important. So what's important? Packet of, packet of crisps. <laughs> okay. So if uh, this packet of crisps is moving and you stay focusing on it, what's important? Packet of crisps. What is the still point? Packet of crisps. We're just following it it becomes still, doesn't it? And everything else is unimportant in the background. The competition in the universe and in all the, for all the so-called powers that were is all for your attention. Because having you focus on it makes it part of the still point, which makes it part of reality. It doesn't make it part of the unimportant background nonsense, which is what most of it deserves to be. And this is what happens in, I mean, I work in mental health, and it's a really interesting thing, just to sport work, just to filling holes and all the rest of it, but I find it very interesting because, you know, all of us have stuff to do with our mental well-being that is absolutely, f you know, we're fascinating beings, we're all a bit bizarre, let's admit it, do you know what I mean? We're a bit, we're a bit bimbly weird, really, I mean, let's be honest about our stuff in our private moments, do you know what I mean? We're, we're odd characters, and it's so funny how we have all this sort of stuff, and it's all about things that we pay attention to. So mental health and well-being is all about, it's all about what you pay attention to. What is it that you make big in your world? What is it that you give significance and relevance to? What becomes important? Because that's what you feed. It's what you charge. It's what you give your thought and emotional manifesting power to. And then all of a sudden that reality will validate. It'll validate, of course it will validate your perception. You know, of course it will. You can find stuff out all over the place that will suit whatever logical rationalization you want to make. It's incredible the stuff we can come up with about the same event. You know, the number of stories that we can all make up and the permutations of, you know, conspiracy and paranoia and all this sort of stuff, self-importance and self-pity and all the stuff that we can imbue into everyday events is staggering. So it's personal fascination with mine. <laughs> Um, mainly because of its impact on me and my life, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that I'm any different here. This is the fascination with self, really, isn't it? The fascination with the silly hurdles we create for ourselves and how difficult we make it for ourselves and how much we, we trip ourselves up along the way. Where then you just have to laugh. It's a divine comedy of trying to work out what on earth is going on here, you know. And um, and you know, I want to take it into that sort of realm. We, we you know, we're just taking things too a bit too seriously. You know, and things that are going on in the world, you know, that are making us feel helpless and powerless, we're taking it a bit too seriously because 
actually most of it is just a story to you. I said this last time I was here. It's just a story. Okay, there ain't no bombs on your head. There's no man outside your door with a knife right now. Everything you hear that is not part of your immediate reality is a story and nothing more. And that's not about you comparing your life to them or trying to feel blessed because it's not you and all that sort of stuff. Irre irrelevant, irrelevant, irrelevant. It's all about actually saying, well, what is your reality? What is your world? How about getting into that for a while? Because isn't it that which has been neglected? Because you're feeding into all these other stories of other people's worlds and other people's agendas and situations. And really this, you know, it's, this is full on, this is massive. You can absolutely transform your world this year, I guarantee you. It's a personal stamped vouched promise if you can apply some of this stuff and try and get your head around it because it is abstract because we're all bonkers. You know, we absolutely are. And I was talking to a lady earlier because, um, you know, this is, I, I do this, I do a whole series of, of workshops on what I call understanding the bodies because we have different, we have more than one body. And we all navigate them every single day, okay? So this is the body you're familiar with, yeah, the one you see in the mirror. So this sort of stuff hurts that body, all this sort of stuff, yeah. Okay, so when I want to point to stuff in relation to this body, I'll say, well, here's my foot, you know, and, you know, here's my head, and there's, there's the wall, and all this sort of stuff, there's the floor. But if I want to talk about, say, my emotional body and how I feel, because my feelings of like happiness and sadness aren't the same as what it feels like to do this or to go to the toilet or to sleep which is about the physical body do you know what i mean this is where we talk about this is what dimensions are dimensions are about quality they're about these really subtle qualities of fundamental difference of experience but it doesn't mean we're not experiencing them but they're distinct so if i want to point to you know i want to point to my foot and my hand that's easy there we go and if i don't know the word for it then it's fine i can just go and you know i'm talking about the hand yeah but if I want to point out how I'm feeling, and I would say, well, I feel happy or I feel sad, that's nice and easy. But what about when we were feeling some of those complex stuff? Or when we didn't know how we felt? Teenage, teenage times, when we were teenagers. Mom and Dad, how do you feel? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Or have you got kids? I don't know. Because they don't know. They haven't. And M. Scott Peck, anybody heard of M. Scott Peck? I love him, man. I've never met him, but great books. And uh, psychiatrist who wrote about human love. It's a wonderful book called The Road Less Travelled, highly recommended. But in his second book, People of the Lie, which is about evil, he talks about coming to terms with something. And well, he says to come to terms with something is to come to the name. Because a term for something is a name for it. And so actually what's happening with teenagers is we haven't come to terms with how we feel. We don't know, we can't point it out to somebody else. In the same way that we point things out with this body, with the emotional body, we can point things out too. But it's a different set of tools because we don't have the hand, the hands don't work for the emotional body. So we have a support tool for that that can help show how we feel with the emotional body, which is really useful. It can show you how I feel without me knowing the words. What is that, anyone? What's the thing that can show you how I feel without me knowing the words and without you needing to hear them? Expressions. Body language. Not just body language. The face. Your face. Your facial expressions tell. Everything anybody needs to know that has any insight into emotions. And that's when I can be used. I mean, this is interesting, this is incredible. This is the first place we use spells to control an internal space. So when we're feeling something, somebody comes in and they spot it and they're like, Oh, are you okay? Do you want to talk about it? And what's the first thing people say? Nah, nah I'm fine. <laughs> so there we go, we stick a signpost, we stick a spell up to point somebody away from our internal space. And thus we control our internal space, our emotional space. And if it's somebody we know, we might say, yeah, actually, do you know, this has been getting to me, I don't really know, blah, 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 you know. And so we, this is where we start to control what's going on with our emotional state in a way. And I mention it to show where, how much we're not in control of that gateway of things which affect us and things which don't, which lead us to the concept of sovereignty and freedom again, which I'll we'll get to, which is about things which affect our internal state and take us away from feeling good about ourselves and take us away from this, you know, the fundamental state we were born in because that's the issue. It's not about making the change first of all. First of all is buy yourself some respite, you know, from the onslaught. But that's fine, that's the emotional body. But then, you know, we've got the mental body as well, which is really bizarre because it does its own thing too. And um, <clears throat> so if you think about things which are only mental because it's a really interesting thing. Humans are becoming mental in my opinion. 
you know, and then what I mean by that is I'm actually becoming awakened mentally speaking, which is all this sort of stuff about, this is the realms of consciousness and language and uh, geometry and uh, all this sort of stuff. And what's funny though is that if we're talking about things which have only mental substance, they have no emotional content and no physical structure, politics, morality, existentialism, philosophy, these things have no emotional content whatsoever and no mental substance, no philosophy there whatsoever. So when we want to talk about them and we want to point to those things to each other, where the heck do we point? At the physical buildings. And this is where the spells get alright, no, uh, this is where our command of spelling and language comes in. Because halfbet, language, all that sort of stuff is the realm of the mind. And it's all about us understanding that it's where these things are pointing. That is what is determining our mental reality. And who's in control of that? Are you in control? You should, you should be. And the reality is you are. You can regain that control. But it's all about this thing called attention. So where is it? Because attention is actually about our... Tension. T-E-N-S-I-O-N. It's about our tension. Focus on the back of the trip. <laughs> our tension is created. Which allows you to zoom in if needs be. You can project part of your awareness to zoom right in to some of the nuances of the corner. The picture, the letters, whatever. The living magic of, you know, your divine energetic substance we're talking about here is incredible, enjoy it, you know. Get back into the playfulness of it because it is the thing that's tripping all of us up with our lack of control of it. And we really need to get a handle on it this year, if of any years, of any of the years to come, please, let's try and get a grip and grow up and get a handle of that because we have, where we have this, you know, Everybody is the same. So, here's, you know, let me just, I'll come back to that point in a moment. So, back to this idea of the bodies again. So, you're, na you're navigating these bodies every day. So, <clears throat> say you're listening intently to somebody, um, like maybe this evening, and um, everything around you might actually not be that important. It might all be a bit blurred. And you may be going, yeah, 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 I can see what you mean. Yeah, no, 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 I can't see where you're going with this. Or what the hell is he on about? Or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Where? What's actually happening is we're navigating a different space. We're not navigating this physical space. We're elsewhere. We're not, this is when we're working in these other bodies. And it's what I call the pre-conscious. And we can get into the pre-conscious dead easily. But it's understanding how much of our limitation rests there in the pre-conscious part that tells us everything about the world before we act. And getting into that pre-conscious is so important because that's where we, can, we, we, we find all this sort of self-tripping behaviours that we've created for ourselves and all these things which, you know, are, are, seem to be this pre-programmed self-sabotage manoeuvre that seems to be happening in our lives at times or whatever it is. You know, most of us have something in our pre-conscious that is making our, you know, fulfilment in life backfire somewhat. And my vested interest is in helping folk kind of get into that and kind of get a handle on it because I really am, you know, that's how I see we all get satisfaction. You know, it's, it's not something we can do by ourselves and we have to facilitate each other to do it. It's that mutual service thing. But, um, so, we, you know, we're navigating these bodies every day. There's a physical world pointing like this, the emotional, the mental, and then there's other bodies as well. But we're usually so wrapped up in what's going on in the emotional and mental, we can't pay attention to the rest. So you've got to think about, um, okay, bodies. So, when you picked up this body, you were all like this. Right, and you were defecating freely and urinating and <laughs> dribbling and all sorts Still of up. stuff. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> that? Okay, yeah, exactly. And that's a good day. <laughs> so we all started off that way. Now, we had this, um, we had, you know, we had no body awareness. We had all sorts of other awareness, but we had no body awareness. Now, what happened was, you went from that to being able to stand up, put a jacket on, walk, 
Go to the bar. Go to the bar. Look at all this stuff. Look at what's happening here, right? He's negotiating around all these objects. He's <laughs> making his body walk. Look at that. How the hell did he manage to do that? From lying on the oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. A lot of that happens. Yeah. But basically, you went from that lying there to being able to make this body walk in about a year, and you did it just by the power of observation. Because nobody showed you how to make muscles work and how to do all the doodah inside. You never saw any of that, you just saw grown ups doing this. How did you do it? Everybody, right now, lift up your left arm slowly like this. Do it. How did you do that? Because we see the others doing it. Sorry? Because we see other people doing it. No, but how? How did you do it? How did you do it? Right. I'm not asking because you're so oh, deep. How did you do it? A mental thing. A me exactly. Is it like the connection of two bodies then? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm just asking you if you knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to just sit there and go, how crazy is it that I can just go right arm up? It just goes so. up. And it just the bottom, <laughs> But what gets me is you don't even have to say right arm up. I know. Look, I'm not saying right arm wave randomly. It's just doing it. You know, amazing. And this is, a, this, this is what goes on in our preconscious is about the management of intent and things like that. But what, what I'm getting at is that you went from a spasmic kicking to an incredible dexterity with this body. An incredible dexterity. To the, anybody here got kids? You know, it takes a baby months to be able to, like, grab a glass in space. Do you know what I mean? Years to be able to pick up a pint like this. You know, years. It's astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> I reap the fruit, excuse me. It was all worth it. <laughs> you must, you must worth it for that. <laughs> yes. No. But no, but my point is that, okay, that is the case for all of you physically, and I can vouch for that because I can witness your dexterity. But what is the case with your emotional self, if we had to picture it as a body? What state would it be in as it's wandering about the place? Because for many people, they would have like their legs trapped up like this, and it'd be like this, going down the street, you know, and they're bobbing along, and all this sort of stuff is going on. Because of pre-programmed stuff we've got set up that's operating in our pre-conscious. And that's the sort of stuff we need to, that's the authority we need to try and get at this year. That's what we need to be getting at, because that is the that is the, the, the key to our sovereignty and the sovereignty of ourself and the sovereignty of our good feeling. Because all our bodies are the same. So when we because of so the emotional body didn't get didn't really get birthed until like puberty. It was in gestation up until then, and at puberty when it's birthed forth, it is exactly the same as the physical body did. Last say, yeah, yeah, love, shame, guilt, self consciousness, uh, blue, all these things. And in the same way that we had no control of our arms or legs, these emotions just boom. They were like these unfettered waves, you know, these unrestrained torrents that we, we didn't, you didn't even know what they were. In the same way that as an infant, that arm would just fly out and hit the wall and I'd hurt myself or whatever. But that assistance that we got and that support and the examples that were set for us to move to a dexterous wielding with our physical body, where were they for our emotions? How many times have you picked up by your parents after falling and blah 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 and being sold and all the rest of it? Where was that during your emotional infancy? Which really took place at puberty and all the rest of it and beyond. And the problem for most of it is that, you know, our then 20s and 30s and beyond are dealing with the aftermath of all the dysfunction that arose as the lack, through the lack of support during the journey that should have led to emotional dexterity. Instead, you know, most of us still have to deal with it now. So what we now live in, for most of us, we live in a world of conflicting kind of um, agendas between the different bodies. Because they all have their own agenda, like planets in the solar system. Okay, the sun is, yeah, it shines its light on all of them, but Pluto wants to do a different thing from Earth. Uranus, you know, it wants to do its thing. So, your aspects are the same. So here's the examples that you'll all be familiar with. Uh, well, I will be familiar with anything. Anyway. It may or may not resonate. So chocolate for me is an interesting one. So chocolate is something that I've had a very, very soft spot for for most of my life. And uh, yeah, my gums are suffering as a result. But hey, um, it may well have been worth it as well. Um, but the point for me is, it is one where there is a lot of attention. So if we want to talk about this, yeah, I'm going to have to go back to the attention. Sorry, I just want to talk about this mastery of the body thing for a moment. Mind me, somebody. Okay, 
So, um, so chocolate is an interesting one. So yeah, it's an interesting one for tension. So if we imagine everybody, there's going to be anybody got any tobacco on them? Who's got tobacco? Can I have some tobacco, please? Have anybody got any chocolate on them? Yeah. Right, the chocolate. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. No, no, no. We're just going to put them here. We're just going to put them here. This is just then. a magic trick how to get people's tobacco. Here we go. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Because obviously, for different people in the room, these objects will create different tensions depending on your particular slant. And some of them may be a mental tension, some of them may be an emotional tension. And uh, what's interesting is that even if they're not there to point at, the interesting situations they can create in our lives, where our physical body may just be sitting there, but there can be all sorts of stuff going on in our heads as to whether we are justifying whether we're going to go and buy this bar of chocolate or make this chocolate buying decision or this tobacco buying decision. You know, and so the physical body will just be standing there, but inside a torrent rages, or it may not be, it may just be a healthy debate, it may be a slime match, it may be, you know, whatever. But this is actually about being honest about the fact that the emotional and the mental body have different agendas, just like the physical body has a different agenda. The physical body is only really interested in, you know, eating and pooing and peeing and things like that. It really doesn't want to exercise that much if you give it a chance, but if you make it, it will enjoy it, all that sort of stuff. It really doesn't have that much that it wants. It just wants a bit of rest every now and again. It's fairly easy to satisfy. We all accept it. We don't even talk about it. We don't mind if people need to go to the loo and things like that. It's totally fundamental in our culture. So, you know, body needs are easy to meet. Emotional and mental needs are a bit, a bit, a bit more complex. So, what will happen is, you know, physical body will just be standing there and inside, emotions will be like, oh yeah, I fancy some of that. You know, that's what I want. There's a bit of tension there. But the mental body might be saying, oh, well, no, you'll be fat. And, oh, yeah, you know, you don't really want to be doing that. You've been having too much, blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. And this war will rage until one wins and either the physical body will remain and go and do something else under the instruction of the mind or it will perambulate itself down to the garage or to the shop or whatever and buy whatever it is you want or take the object off the shelf. And it will just follow the instruction of whichever body takes over the physical at that moment. Because it's very interesting that at times our emotional body can be in control of our physical body for an extended period of time where our mind will seem to be in the background and we may not, you know, we might be struggling with that. And other times the mind might be really in control and the emotions may be sort of somewhat subjugated. But the point of mastery is about getting the balance between them all to get them to work together. So that we have this dexterity that we enjoy with the physical, with our emotional health and well-being and expression, as well as our mental. This is the, you can, you can sum it up, you know, you can, you, you, can, you can apply whichever path you want, but I will say that that is actually the objective of all of them, is to get to that stage of dexterous expression and, and you know, um, containment and control of all these, all these different aspects. Um, anyway, back to this point of tension. So dishes are another good example and housework, these are all good examples where we can witness the different agendas within ourselves. But it's to be okay with that, to realise that actually we are multifaceted, we are a we. And it's actually, that is the healthy way of understanding things. We are this divided unity. If you look at what your body's made up of, it's made up of different parts, isn't it? And they don't all do the same thing. So it doesn't make sense for us to look for these sort of same structures outside in the world. You know, we really need to get a handle on, okay, well, what's going on here? What do we actually want? What are we made up of? What's going, you know, and take ownership of our own internal state and reality. So, attention. The springs is now. That's just, we just looked at the microcosmic in your own world there to get a little peer on the old internal window, but now we'll jump back out into that macrocosmic arena that we're witnessing with all the psychotic nut jobs that are in control of the buttons and the warplanes and the jets and, you know, sending trips to Iran and sending the, you know, the NDAA, you know, aware of that, the NDAA, uh, the National Defence Administration Act that Obama signed on the 31st of December. Nutter, you know, the point is, the. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand that from a particular perspective, I understand where these people can justify these things, because they're coming from a state of paranoia. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, there's a great, it summed up for me, I was asked for an interview last year about what I thought the NWO was, what did I think the New World Order was. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you mean other than the powers that were, well, okay, I would say, uh, I don't know. But then a friend sent me a document later that year that summed it up for me. And it was a document published by the Rockefeller Foundation in 2010, May of 2010. And it was what they called their, I don't know, some kind of strategic scenarios document. And in it, 
this is so this is a well-funded, genuine above board document. You can go and get it yourself. You can download it from the internet from the Rockefeller Foundation's website. This was their um, sort of like think tank um, guidance document for massive corporations and countries to look at for their considerations for the coming times. And they decided to use a series of scenarios to paint it. And they've divided it into five different scenarios. And in those five scenarios, they look at timelines over the next 20 years. So this is what this whole publication is. And it is absolutely, you know... So here's an example. So it reads like a narrative. So it reads like um, the terrorist attack in the 2012 Olympic Games, you know, killed 12,000, but then gave rise to this, that, and the other. And, you know, this technological infrastructure was able to be implemented, you know, was implemented and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, this led rise to great, this did, you know, unrest in these areas. And they then, you know, called the 2010 to 2020 decade, the doom decade. And it goes on and on to project into like 2030. And all of them, each of the scenarios about these mass, major, made, mad pandemics and terrorism and warmongering and all the rest of it, it was just riddled with this stuff. And, you know, with in the imagery and, you know, the CCTV and the weaponry and all the rest of it. And I'm looking through this and I'm thinking, this is actually what the new world world order is. It's people who vision based on fear and paranoia. And these people are terrified. They're terrified of illness and they're terrified of, you know, their own mortality and fragility. And they're terrified of their neighbour. They're terrified of anything they don't know or understand. And that's what it is. It's action-based on it. It's fear-based. It's, it's, it's an absolute expression of that fear-based action. And that's the tension they want to create, which is where... So, uh, you know, I was talking about these spirals of intensity. So actually what should be happening in my mind is that we have all these, we're all involved in like different, all the subjects you think about and all the ones you feed with your emotional and mental energy that you give credit to and you make part of your focus and the still point of your world. So your world is made up of a, a whole series of still points of the things that you choose to focus on. And you can change them at any time, but you're not aware that you can change them at any time. But literally your whole reality is literally that series of still points. You see, you've got like a thousand of them around you, or whatever, that are, that are well, what you're focusing on at a given time. So, um, ah, I lost it, where was I? <laughs> Spiral. <laughs> Tension spirals, thank you. So really, what I, what I kind of vision is that, you know, your vocational kind of contribution is completely unique compared to yours, completely unique to yours and yours and all the rest of it. It actually should be about each of our spiral of variety adding to the whole. Now I went through, this is something I've only realised recently, and people's public, trying to form the People's Public Trust has taught me this, because I've wanted to make it everybody's trust and not mine, because there's nothing worse than people not having things, and it's um, a really interesting thing to get people to own something, to feel like it's I realised that we, you know, we, we kind of, we, our culture has kind of taught us all to be generalists and not specialists anymore, where we all think we're a bit of a philosopher, a bit of a psychologist, a bit of a, a, bit of an IT person, a bit of a, a bit of a marketeer, we can all be self-employed and do blah blah blah, blah and do it all ourselves. But what I've realised as I've more awakened into my own vocation is that that's nonsense and the more I awaken to my vocation the more useless I become at anything else. And it's become one of the most empowering things to realise rather than me stress and fret and sweat is that I'm actually going to wait until people actually realise that you know, I need a, I really need help in this area and just volunteer for it because that's what seems to happen. As I look around, I really, I really see that you need help with that area. Can I just do it? And I'm like, yeah, please. You know, and it's really, it's an amazing thing though because I just left it as this void for years and just bimbled along just saying, right, now I can't do that. It's, you know, I'm just terrible at it, stressing me or whatever. But it's been a beautiful thing because it's allowed this sort of natural, mutual shared service thing go on and it's helped other people's vocations, you know, awaken. And what I kind of see is that really that's, that's the truth of our individuality. I mean, look around the room, all of you, just now. Look at all of you and how different you all look and how different you all dress and appear. And your intellectual independence and your spiritual and religious independence is one of the greatest things I celebrate about the modern times, is the fact that each of you will have your own relationship and concept of the divine and energy and blah, 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 and all the rest of it. I love that. I think that's great. It's, isn't it an amazing thing? And... Um, it's about us actually realising how valuable that is and how important that is. Is that your specific uniqueness that is absolutely unrepeated anywhere on this planet has a purpose. And I want to see that happen because 
Otherwise, I know we're screwed because that means that, you know, it's like this dysfunctional dream. It's like this limb of the universe doing this, like ours, our emotional or mental one does, you know. And, we, you know, we either become a fat cell of the universe or we become a dysfunctional cancer because we're just mutating into these things that are non-contributory. And we weren't dreamt forth to be non-contributory, in my opinion. You know, but that is my personal opinion. But I don't see that in front of me. I don't see beings that are that are not to be contributed, you all look like you have the capacity to be amazing contributors. And, you know, that's what I want to see. And I think this is what, this is the antithesis of actually what the global agenda is, because the global agenda is about one massive, single spiral of increasing intensity, rather than billions of little spirals of amazing, unique intensity. You see the difference now? Yeah? So actually the reality of what the universe is trying to create is billions of little spirals of individual unique intensity that are all multifunctional and interactional and all the rest of it that we are now stumbling through the how do we actually interact on, on that basis because we don't know how. You know, that's what we've got to have the courage to face is to realise the courage is actually about being in that and being okay and realising that we don't know yet where that's what co-creation is. is how, how do we do this? You know, but, they, but it's to realise that actually what we're being presented with is what we're trying to get swirled into is somebody else's massive, really nasty looking whirlpool. Where's that baby going? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Where is that baby going? And I'm following where that's intensifying and it ain't a packet of crisps and it ain't a bad, nice bar of chocolate and it ain't even some nice tobacco. It's disease, poison, death ridden versions of all of those and I happen to have a really nice relationship with all of those. Not tobacco anymore, that's gone now thankfully. But yeah, the rest of them. But, you know, this is the point about tension. So that's the swirl you're trying to get dragged into, okay? So in this amazing, incredible, universal, energetic park that's around you, all of these little signs and spells and billboards and corporations and all the rest of it are trying to swirl you into that particular spiral. How much do you want to feed it? Because it's pretty intense in there. It's more intense. It's getting absolutely <coughs> off the charts. Bonkers. Down in the innards of that particular spiral, it's off the charts heading toward World War III insanity. This is absolute sociopathic, psychopathic mentalness that's going on. And really, the, you know, there are ways that we can get on top of that, though, both personally within ourselves, by getting the authorities to listen within ourselves, and taking our humanity to, to the people that are surrounded on a daily basis, but also in terms of things like the People's Public Trust, it can genuinely get onto this, because if we actually had public servants that represented us, would we have to worry about the behaviour of corporations and banks and all the rest of it? We wouldn't have to worry about it. They're actually the linchpin. Effective representation is actually what it's all about, if we can get a handle back on that. But anyway, back to the whole personal thing in terms of these spirals. So, if they want to create that particular thing, then, you know, we've got to realise that, actually, what we, we really need to be, you know, more consciously aware of what we're choosing to feed in terms of the opposite spirals to those nasty ones, which are the ones of greater inclusiveness and openness and a reduction of the boundary and an increase in trust in each other and to realise that actually, do you know what, even though it may make me feel fragile and vulnerable, I'm willing to trust the fact that you might be actually a good human being and actually we might, we might share some ideals and, you know, and you know, a desire for it, you know, even though we might disagree on a whole host of things, we might all agree on the fact that we want a safe place for our kids. You know, we might all agree on the fact that, you know, we want to head somewhere that is of a, you know, a, a, a benevolent community. Is that, is that something we can agree on? Mm -hmm. And so this is where it's more about, what I, you know, it's this idea of what I see as, you know, it's many dreams but one vision. So you can have many, many dreams in the same vision, it's fine. It's absolutely fine, but it's about saying, well, okay, so at the moment, the powers that were are still trying to do this whole many dreams, one vision thing, but their one vision is this big, nasty, blah, you know, whirlpool spiral of death and doom and blah. Because it really is. It's like, well, you guys are mental. If you want to go off down there, fine, go for it. But I ain't joining you. Now, you, can, you actually have control of that in your internal reality because remember, it's just a story. It's just a story. It's only there if you look at the headlines and you switch the telly on. Where is it otherwise? Where is it? Or if you take a plane to like that over, you can see it there as well. Yeah, you will. But those are the pockets of manifestation of it. But that is simply the manifestation of what has been fed over here. We're the ones who have fed it. If we stop the feeding of it, and this is the point about tension, is that the, the, the battle is the, for, the, for, for the territory of your internal state. The battle of that is sovereignty. Your internal state, wow, that was well put. Hold on a second.
yeah, the sovereignty of your internal state, because, um, you know, Thank you. The sovereignty of your internal state. Thank you. The sovereignty of your internal state. That's it. That sums it up, basically. That's what, the, that's what the actual battle is for, because it doesn't matter what these stories say about what's going on elsewhere. It's all about how you feel about yourself and uh, your reaction to, the, to that sort of news and whatnot. It's all about your perspective and what you make the still point because they're actually, everything that's happening in the world just now is like a crystallization of past energy. Do you see what I mean? So what we have to do is to realize that's what's going on and actually create a different manifestation of the one that's still to manifest. Do you see that? Do you see the difference there? And so it's about us trying to realize that actually within your boundary of your personal space, you actually have ultimate control. You can switch off any reaction to any word of anything that's happening in the world anywhere. You don't have to give it any attention or attention whatsoever unless you see fit. The problem is there's a whole bunch of it running in pre-programming. That's the problem stuff. That's the stuff that people, even the so-called awakened, don't realize. And that's the authority that dominates your daily life that determines when and who you are your true self with. And that's the wall that there is no rule for breaking it down. There's no method yet. All I do at the beginning of this year is extend an invitation to you that I would love to see you take that struggle on as, you know, part of our shared contribution to each other in these incredible times because I think it's one of the most things that could have the greatest effect. So, I'm going to move to wrap up because I've rambled about so many different things that uh, it's definitely time, but I'll see what uh, I wrote in here, see if there's anything worth finishing on. Because, it, you know, it's difficult to, to, it's a funny thing when we have to accept the fact that we really do operate on many different levels at the same time, and that there is a relationship there, and that sometimes you know, we have, to, we have to look at a different perspective to gain an insight into a particular arena. And this is part of the complexity of it, just accept, you know, it's like, hey, I don't always like the fact I've got emotions, but it doesn't mean I can ever get rid of them. So we have a choice, don't we? The choice is like, am I, going to, am I actually going to take responsibility and try to handle on this, or am I going to continue to, you know, switch myself off to it, not think about it, or whatever, because I really do believe that is the, 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 worst, the worst thing possible, you know, so... I, I was at St Paul's at uh, the Occupy thing um, just before, before Christmas or something like that. There was about 300 people on the steps, I was speaking in the mic, blah blah blah, did the people's public trust thing, call a cuff tie in trance, we didn't do in trance tonight, but in trance is the sign above all the corporate doors, you know, it says in trance, that's what it actually says, that's the spell, it's not in trance, it doesn't mean we in, it's in trance, you know, there trance. you go, there's, you know, these, these signs all over the place. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was doing all this stuff. And at the end of it, when I was talking about taking, I was there to, to canvas for representative action on the bank bay line, you know, to say, right, we can actually go after the public servant to sign that and undo it overnight, no more cuts, none of that. Iceland did it, that's why you don't hear about it, let's do it. You know, who wants to sign up? And from that 200 or whatever, 2 to 300 that were there, about 12 came forward. And I realised after that, that that's their problem. That is the problem, because that is reflective of actually the apathy within us. The fact that, yeah, we are somewhat motivated, we're maybe 10% motivated, we're 15% motivated, but the rest of us, a large part of us can't really be bothered. We'd rather be doing something else, we really want to think about it. We want to be seen to you know. those things, rather than being... Yeah, 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 absolutely, because we all want to have somebody else do it and all the rest of it. And we all have to realise there ain't no knight and a shining horse coming. You, you, I, mean, I said it at the beginning, I'm saying it now, you have got the cast and vote. And I'm here to say that, you know, I can't do what I'm trying to do without you trying to do something, you know, your thing, get a handle on it, you know, to no longer be, you know, where, where you know, the, 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 the consuming fat cell, which is what they want us to be. You know, that's what America has a massive, you know, expression of. It is a, literally a manifestation of, well, okay, you're a giant fat cell. <laughs> you just want to take it. Yeah, it's fine, it's all right, because, you know, what do the individuals contribute? And I say, well, okay, if we're all expressions of what's going on in the body, then either, you know, are we, are, you know, are you behaving like cancer? Are you behaving like a benevolent thing? What is it? And if we look at it, you know, it's fat cells and cancers all over the place. Um, and we have to, we have to, we make a choice on a daily basis. And actually, that was, I realised, that was why the monarchy thing, it all comes together in the end. Monarchy thing was all about the, about governing. And about that, the Queen's oath is about to govern the people of the land uh, according to the laws and customs of those peoples. So the peoples of the land. So that, accepting for numerous different peoples and their various laws and customs. 
But it was an interesting day about the concept of governance because it only has two forms really. It's like I said earlier about the slavery thing and being by consent. It has two forms. It's either a service or it's a dictatorship. One of the two. And actually, every single one of us make that decision every day in our various roles. But the point I'm making with the People's Public Trust is the fact that every single public servant makes that decision on a daily basis whether their extension of the Queen's oath to serve is one where they're here to serve the people. And yeah, what do you want? You know, there's loads of them that are doing a really good service and giving a really good job and blah, 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 and all the rest of it. But the pro they're not the problem, obviously. The, ones are the, the, the problems are the ones who actually see governance as this dictatorship, as this sort of harsh thing. But the funny thing is, there, is that actually we all make that decision on a daily basis, whether we're going to dictate or whether we're going to serve and whether we're going to befriend or whatever. And I think this really does, um, as I said earlier, we've got no right to ask of others what we're not doing ourselves. And I really do think then, it, you know, it does come back to this whole sort of um, realisation that we are all part of the planetary soul. And when I say soul, I mean this. The S-O-L-E. Because we are soul on this planet. One. There's no void. This connects us to the planetary soul. And it's, that soul is singular. Because I'll tell you now, where is there any space on this planet? There's no space. It's an illusion of division. But really, right now, I breathe in. <gasps> And there's no barrier between that and my deepest, most vulnerable internal aspects. And yet I could be breathing in the very same air molecules that were in your deepest, most internal aspect five minutes ago. Then they did, you know, they, they might be in the internal aspect of a dinosaur five billion years ago. Because where has it gone? It's a planetary soul. Singular. Stuff comes in from outer space, and yeah, some stuff might fly out, I don't know. But otherwise, it's generally an influx, isn't it? dust, meteors, all that sort of stuff comes in and feeds the planetary dream. But we are soul. And I realised over Christmas and over the festive period what it means to sell your soul. And it's when we act and behave in a way that we're somehow not connected to each other, we're somehow not all dependent on the space, the environment, the waters, the land, each other. That's what it is to sell your soul. And actually, in a way, all of us sell our souls a bit, and all of us are part of the planetary soul in other ways. But my kind of invitation this year is very much about realising how much of the authority within hasn't been listening to all the stuff you've been learning in the last 10, 20, 30 years, and isn't acting on it. And you know, I just cannot evoke a strong enough kind of call to action if possible for all of us to try and get a handle on that this year have the authority within ourselves listening and try and bring more of that sort of uh, you know, humanity, community spirit and all the rest of it to our very neighbours, our actual environment because this is where it counts. It's not about pontificating about our political position on what's going on in Afghanistan. That's all the peripheral story. That's all the stuff, that's all the manifestation of yesteryear's thoughts. Let's continue, let's feed the thoughts that may manifest in the next few minutes, the way things have been going. And we really can all feed an incredible, incredible video. I genuinely believe that, but it's about responsibility, isn't it? And you actually don't believe that yourself. I'll give you an example of how important sound is, right? You know how important sound is to us? It's bonkers, it's off the charts. What do we call the body parts in here? Organs. Organs, what's an organ? It's a, it's a musical instrument, yeah, okay. What do we call, how do we measure space? What's the word for, in maths, if we want to measure the space? What would it be? Volume. The volume. What do we call it when I rot away after I'm dead? Decomposed. Decomposed. Yeah. Pose yourself, pull yourself together. Yeah. It's sound, it's building sound. We live in a universe. Sound is so fundamental to us, it turns up everywhere in our language and we all just accept it. Does that volume of the space? Sorry? Yeah. Does that mean there's a unichorus? That would be the universe, wouldn't it? Well, would the unichorus the be the singer of the first. universe? Where's the unichorus? Well, the unichorus will be there. Yeah, well, the informing agency. Just wondering. Yeah. Well, this is about some sound for this soul. Perhaps it may lead us to the unichorus. I like it. <laughs> I, I do like your time and attention. I wish you an incredible 
beautiful, amazing, magic-filled, warm year. Yes. Thank you. Can I start off then, Darren, yeah. please? Yeah, you certainly can. Right, chaps, can we just... Uh, um, you, may, you mentioned that, um, that the, the different racial groups on, on the planet at the minute might behave to uh, experience certain express ex explore. expressions yeah. of uh, humanity. Yeah. Do you think that the um, global elite are aware of this bigger picture and as such tailor their agenda to keep us suppressed and in Very a way... Good question. Um, I, you know, I really don't know. I, I would suspect, yes, but I, I, I question whether, um, I, I certainly believe there's, I don't, I don't believe there's any character on the world stage that we know of that exhibits the level of calibre that I would consider to uh, be required to uh, orchestrate the sort of thing that we're seeing around us. I mean, I really do tip my hat to a worthy opponent. I give a lot of respect to the situation we find ourselves in because I was duped for a large part of my life, it took me a while to break out of it, and um, I, I, give, I give credit and respect where it's due. Um, and, you know, this whole concept of things like masonry and things, you know, I mean, I, I think one of the most powerful symbols of control in the, in the world just now is the symbol of the, Maso the Masonic symbol of the G in the set square and compass. And I think through my independent arrival at the importance of particular characters, for me, the symbol of the G in the set square and compass shows that somebody knows at a very, very high level the impact of things like alphabets on consciousness and the manipulation of spelling. I mean, let's face it, we spell all our words because they're spelled. I'm not making that up. Do you know what I mean? That's it. That's what they are. You'll accept it. It's there. They're you know, spelled because they're spelled. Um, and when I, you know, I demonstrate and state the examples, nobody can deny that's a somewhat bizarre and magical or strange. I mean, they use the term magical, but it's certainly a bizarre and potent effect for a series of sounds that construe a word, you know, it's like, okay, so do they actually know? Who knows? You know, I really don't know. It, I don't would, think point, it, it would point to it though, wouldn't it? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, their agenda would seem to point to the fact that they're, they're aware of stuff that we're only just starting to realise. Yeah, it's whether any individual is aware or whether they're just acting as an expression of something, you see, that's what's really interesting about it, because there's one thing, the, the concept of, a, of a, an, an orchestrating or, or, or informing agent at the top would imply quite a level of um, not just insight, but, you know, kind of malevolent intent as a result of that insight, which would seem to be contrary to anything that insight could reveal, if you know what I mean. You know, so it's like, well, that would say, how could somebody arrive at that sort of conclusion of action? from any sort of deep, lasting insight that could give rise to the level of skill that could orchestrate manoeuvres like these. Is that presupposing that they're not the same as us? That's what I'm saying as we come in there, isn't it? Sorry? The malevolence. Yeah, but I think... That's where, this, that's where it links in with the Satanism, isn't it? Possibly, yeah. Possibly. I mean, this is the interesting thing. I tend to... I, you know, I avoid those things, but I shouldn't. I, I avoid those subjects. I shouldn't really, because those of you who know my stuff about Goo and about the lost word and the first word and all the rest of it will know that actually I have a, you know, a major, major bone of contention with the church in general and with those, you know, both Christian and satanic agendas. It's, 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 they're both one and the same for me, anyway. But um, I, I'm not sure wh where the um, where I'm willing to point the finger. I, had, I, I used to. I went to a big fair of poetry a number of years ago, and I, I had a I had a poem called Judgment, that was just quite simple, and it was I find you guilty of being like me. I find me guilty of being like you. Blinded to my treasures by mine's incessant pleasures. And that's it. <laughs> but off the back of that, I became wary of finger pointing. But I really recommend the kind of questions M. Scott Peck's book called People of the Lie Raises. There's a book about human evil. He's a psychiatrist who deals with love in his first book and evil in his second book. And he presents amazing case studies to make us challenge our conception of these things. Because he says basically, you know, it's supposed to be coming to terms with something. And he says, well, nobody wants to use the E word anymore. 
Nobody wants to talk about evil. They say, well, if we haven't come to terms with it, how do we know we're dealing with it? How do we know where to point to it? How do we know where evil is? And if we're not going to name it, then how can we deal with it? So what is it? You know, and he was talking about bad and bad people and sociopaths and psychopaths and things like that. And he says, well, then, in his experience, they're not evil. And I agree with them. I love it. I love the book. It's great. You know, and it's very challenging. And then from my own experience as well, I'm working with, you know, uh, people who have committed crimes as a result of mental illness and things like that and all the rest of it. I've not encountered evil. You know, not, as, not, 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 not in that sort of sense. Badness, okay, fine. But there's an interesting thing about badness, and that is it's bloody obvious. You can spot it a mile away. There's no qualms about badness. You can, you can spot it, you can stay safe and stay away from it unless it decides to try and impose itself upon you. But evil is something else. Evil is something which pretends to be good. It isn't. That's the problem. And if we are not willing to come to terms with evil, then we are. And I mean that this year. Because what we're dealing with is evil. What we're dealing with is that which pretends to be good but isn't. I think sometimes we also need to stop pointing the finger at the unknown as evil. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Well said, brother. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Because this, but the point well, is, though, just what's really interesting... Pointing the finger in the wrong direction just because it's unknown doesn't make it right, right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but that, what we have to recognise and own is that that is an expression of actually an aspect within all of us which is a, a fearful reaction to the unknown. Fearful reaction to as we were infants in the dark room at night, you know. And it's like the unknown became this potential male malevolent entity when in actual fact it wasn't. And any of you got kids now as you're trying to wrestle with that child and say, go to sleep, it's all right, you know, you're blooming at home, there's nothing wrong, you know, and they're like, ah, not like we are here. You know, this huge abandonment thing, and it's like, it's okay. You know, because they haven't got that sense of context. But the point is, we really are in the stage where we need to be looking at what we are dealing with. And I have, up until now, shied away from the crux of that debate. And it's been for personal reasons. Um, but I do think we're dealing with evil, but whether it's, whether it's actual, an in, you know, an individual sort of particular choice that you can finger point on or whether we actually all just have to take joint responsibility for it, I know you can't, see, sure. you can't see it in black and white, can you, but yeah. like, all the evidence seems to point to it, though. It I mean, does. instinct seems to point to yeah, it. Yeah, it does, it does. It's there. Well, that's what I mean about whether they're an expression of something, because we have to realise that all the humans in the world are expressing an aspect of us. Okay, we're all brothers and sisters of infinity, that's the thing. We're all, we're all expressions of the same soul. What if they weren't? But no, the S-O-L-E is singular, it's one. We are all one whole, and it's an aspect of self. We, and we may not like it, but everything is an aspect of self. Is anybody familiar with Goetean science? Goethe, by the work of Walter Russell. So Goethe was around at the same time as Newton, and he debunked most of Newtonian science within like 15 minutes of hearing about it. And why we're not getting his stuff, I don't know. But it's all about what's called the wholeness of nature. It's about saying, well, you cannot look at something in isolation because nothing exists in isolation. So all of our science is based on taking something in isolation and looking at how it behaves, yes, and then it's acting the on that. Gone, right? But it's absolutely impossible. That's what Russell. The law of one, yes, it is. But kind of, um, there's some interesting perspectives raised by these particular individuals that is worth accrediting. So um, Goethe, in particular, wrote some beautiful stuff about color, about uh, science in general, and about how things exist in conjunction with each other. And um, Walter Russell, a bit later, in the 20th century, wrote about um, the fact that the universe isn't a created one, it's an, an ongoing co-creating one, which was absolutely sort of like fascinating stuff. But he makes the point that actually motion is only possible as a result of imbalance. If you have equilibrium, there's nothing, there's stasis, there's stillness. So if you picture two children of equal weight on the opposite sides of a seesaw, Okay, two children of equal weight and opposite sides of a seesaw in a state of stillness. There's no motion, there's no activity. There's stillness, it's beautiful, it's lovely, brilliant. But if they want to have some fun, if they want to have a bit of a rock, you know, and experience some seesaw action, they've got to throw themselves off balance. Okay? It's got to be done, otherwise there ain't no fun happening. And this, I think, it hints at our fallacy of duality. 
of the measurement of one over the other. When does left become right? When does up become down? When does hot become cold? They're completely relative. It's totally relative. At different times as well. And I think, you know, when I say we're all one, I mean we're all one. I mean, there is no way. Where, where else is there? What else is there? Where is, where is the space anywhere? You know, space in itself. It, it, we're, we're, we're all, you know, the, the, the oneness of one expressing itself against the backdrop of void. And trust me, the concept of void is not a pretty place to be in. In the face of void, there is only boredom and insanity over an infinite, infinite period of time. That's rubbish. You know, that's why we have this incredible great manifestation thing going on, so we can all budge off each other and throw each other off balance a little bit and fend off the boredom of infinity. Because the truth is insane. Sorry? Because the truth is insane. Of course it is. Of course it is. Absolutely. The reality, you know, the reality <coughs> of things is that there is no coherent structure. We actually and nurture and de the delicately hinged frameworks that are the structures that we all rely on. DNA, I mean, well, all these things are so delicate, <coughs> so fragile. You know, they've arisen over billions of years of trying to maintain things against the backdrop of void and infinity. This is getting up into the big cosmic mind stuff, but you know, you're all expressions, direct individual personal expressions of cosmic mind. You can tap right back into it if you want. All we're talking about here is low level expressions of that. And I, you know, I for one, I like to f flow fluid between them all, and I know it can be challenging for people, but I see no, no, Part of this thing I mentioned earlier about we need to break through this crap of well I'm spiritual on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night and you know I'm going to be myself with people that I like and I feel safe with but oh no around you I'm going to behave like I did when I was at primary one and you know I'm not really going to shoot, say, say who I am or what I really feel or think until I've sussed you out and see whether I'm safe it's like for goodness sake what, what are we afraid of what are we afraid of who are we afraid of you know what I mean? We've been here with the brothers and sisters of infinity. We've been here a billion times. And it's like, you know, that courage you had as a child. I'm not making that up. That's not a conspiracy. You were there. You were that courageous, amazing, incredible energy, love-filled child, you know? I want to see that energy boozing back out because it is there. It's not gone anywhere. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I can't remember what the question was. Anyway, the evil. Yeah, evil. Yeah, we are up against evil. There's no doubt about it. But I'm loath to, you know, blame anybody for it because I see it as an expression of our own apathy. I see it as an expression of our own lack of listening to ourselves. I'm speaking of myself as well and owning that heartfelt and saying, "Shit, I need to look at myself because actually, for how what percentage of my day am I censoring?" Am I restraining? Am I containing? Am I not expressing the exuberance of how upset I am about how things are and how upset I am about how I'm being represented and how upset I am about the fact that we can actually have a happy community and I'm afraid to talk to somebody in the bus and say, what bullshit is this all about? What madness have we allowed ourselves to be sucked into? Whose spiral do we jump into and how do we break out of it in a way that we can feel safe and powerful and all the rest of it? And it's really about the courage to actually at least head in that direction and realise that that's the direction to go in because even the most awakened people I know are only expressing that best of themselves a percentage of the time and that's what really has to change and then it doesn't matter about this whole evil question I think evil is just you know the apathy of wanting somebody else to take over and all this it's just the expression of self you know that, it's a bit that not far away I got an email after uh, the last talk I told by you know on our open mic night yeah and uh, I've sort of forwarded it to you, that's quite funny, but someone yeah. uh, made the point that you were, you were in effect abdicating um, humanity's responsibility to take on these people that are doing this to us. I, yeah, I, know, I know the yeah. point you're getting that we're doing it to ourselves in a way, Yeah. but it's a form of abdication in as much as if we ignore it, it'll go away. Yes, Is that exactly. necessarily the case? If they've got this agenda that they've had for millennia yeah. of controlling humanity. No, they're not, it's not going to go away. This is what I mean about this pre-conscious stuff. So, I mean, basically, right now, the issue, the issue we face, brothers and sisters, is that when you are at home, on your own, with no other stimulus, no, no, no TV on, no, no newspaper in front of you, the measures you place upon your actions in those times, they're what I consider to be the problem. The constraints you place upon yourself, the questions that inhibit your choice of what you're willing to structure in terms of your next series of actions in the coming days, weeks and months when you're on your own. That's what I'm talking about. 
that's the that's the battle of sovereignty and what's going on and co-creative because that's the censorship and it's all sitting in this incredible mad space that most of us can't even get into. Now, um, I'm not abdicating responsibility for it. I'm actually advocating, you know, basically saying I'm not talking about that side of it because actually not, most people I know of aren't actually in a position where they can actually properly battle evil in my opinion because they haven't actually got a level of mastery within themselves that's capable to do it and I've never said it publicly before but actually I'll say it today and actually the reality is we all have to do a bit and we're all capable of doing a bit but most people the, the best thing you can do is look at yourself the best so don't worry about the rest deal with that once you've done the looking at yourself bit you need a level of insight and acuity and a level of harsh honesty at your own nonsense to be able to stumble upon the sort of level of compassion, vulnerability and tenacity that's required to tackle cosmic evil. Do you know what I mean? It's full on, otherwise, you know, it's like sending cannon fodder out. You know, I know and I wouldn't want to be instrumental in doing that. I really wouldn't. But um, and, and again, I mean I'm only saying it because I genuinely believe that's where the maximum benefit is. So it's like tonight you've heard me talk about a whole range of subjects. You know, you've heard me talk about stuff from way up mad cosmic spiritual stuff down to way grounded political sort of grounded, you know, sort of stuff. There's a whole spectrum there. And it's because really I want to be talking about the other stuff and arming you to be this incredible, amazing, divinely mandated, empowered being, you know, as part of this amazing species dreamt forth by this planet. Astonishing stuff lies ahead for us. But when I went out trying to run these events in, in not being a very good marketeer, what I discovered was that people couldn't, didn't have the attention for it because they were so worried about what was going on with the state and this and then that and the other. And so I turned my attention to that and that's what the People's Public Trust came out of. And so now I'm recognising that, well, right now, that's enough. We don't need, let's not do, I tell you what, if you feed into this thing, this People's Public Trust idea, if everybody here fed into that, the amount of energy that they felt about all the stuff that was needed in the world, I guarantee you, you'd create the change in this time. Just this group alone, as a core, focused public trust unit did absolutely transform the entirety of public services in Manchester within the space of one year. I 100% guarantee it, but it would be a case of commitment. And it's about saying, well, okay, how, how much do you want change? How much, do, how much are we willing to be the change? How much can we commit into it? How much are we willing to have faith and trust in our capacity to cope, and our capacity to meet our own needs, to be able to survive basically and all the rest of it? Because every one of you standing here right now is testament to the fact that you are able, that you are capable, because you're here. You've proven it. In the face of adversity, of challenges, in the face of situations you never thought you'd got through, you're here. And you're all looking quite healthy and, you know, able to perambulate and all the rest of it. Do you know what I mean? So, but, um, so that's why I don't talk about it. It's not an abdication of responsibility. It's because otherwise, I'm sorry, mate, you're talking to shit if you want to stand there and point the finger at evil when you've got a little Nazi dictator in your head that won't listen to the truth about your own vulnerability and fragility and anger at yourself and all this sort of stuff. I'm not even going to entertain you in the conversation of finger pointing somebody else because they're just an expression and manifestation of what's dominating your world at the minute. So actually that's why they're dominating the world out there. And I'm not even quite sure you can actually deal with that reality right now. And I say that starkly. You know, that's the point. So, yeah. If people want to talk about evil, they need to come to me and show that they've got a level of insight to talk about evil. Yeah, we don't want to finish on something to leave. Oh. <laughs> boring, boring, boring oh. people. Uh, yeah. I don't know, tell us the good stuff that you think. Well, that you this massive, incredible kind of... Well, the thing is, we all have this... You know, we, as I said earlier, we all have the decision every day. We, make, we face a choice of whether, how we're going to make the community. It literally applies to, you know, in the shops. It's freezing in the morning. You know, everybody's a bit miserable. We're all being dragged out to work, sitting in queues in the traffic. What's your vibe? How are you feeling? What's the expression on your face? You know, we can lift the spirits of each other a thousand times a day if we choose to. And it costs us nothing. It doesn't actually cost us anything. And these things really are simple. And I'll tell you what, they are transformational. It really is all in the little stuff. Yeah? It's so funny, you know, they talk about the devil's in the detail. The opposite is true as well. You flick it around by paying attention to the detail. Instead of saving your moments of super good focus for those little personal arenas, you can spread it and diffuse it daily quite easily. And it is costless. But it's about us getting in. I think before we can get to that space, I'm not, I don't want to say that sort of stuff to people because I'm not about us affecting things. I'm not about us adopting behaviours as this sort of pose that we feel we should do to fake it until we make it. And there's an element of fake it till we make it in all that we do. But I'm much more about us getting into the understanding of the fact that we're all one. 
and what it means to be soul and what it because to me that's more the fundamental that's the underlying bit because then the rest of the behavior isn't forced mm. it's not something we have to adopt it comes quite naturally because we feel it it's like you know what i don't know who you are but you know i'm about an idiot at times and you know i'm sure you are too and i see that we're both here at this time and i'm not you know the problem I'm is going to try and make it a nice community for you, you know, and just put out, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say with that. It's just like, so it's each owning it and realising that we're not quite as developed and evolved as we'd like to think and to give credit for our, you know, emotional crap that we're, that's not quite caught up with the rest of our consciousness and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's subtle, it's not simple. It's definitely not simple and we have to give credit to that lack of simplicity, you know. Of course, yeah, sorry. It's just that for every good idea that sounds lovely, those yeah. people, the, you may even call them manifestations of our evil thoughts or our yeah, bad yeah, thoughts or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Those people, what, those our people, brothers and sisters of eternity and infinity them, as well, um, end up usurping a good idea and yeah. twisting it to their own yeah. agenda. Like, for example, you're talking about this whole idea of oneness and everything. Yeah. And absolutely, I'm down with it, absolutely. They will twist that idea but should that into scare their you own off? one world religion. I agree. I agree. And that's I what agree. it's all about. Should that scare you off trying for that or something better? Not a one world government, but being able to. Do you know get something? Stacey. I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to jump in here because here's something that I only stumbled upon literally in the last week. Literally, last week, I realised what it means that the greatest enemy is within. The greatest enemy is within. It's not about our traditional idea of adversary. It's about the fact that all of this fucking pontification about the nuances of this, that, and the other. So we make decisions based on sixth and seventh level second guessing. Do you know what I mean? So we make a decision based on, ah, well, they're doing this and that and the other, and then because of that, they're going to be thinking this, and so they'll be expecting me to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to do this because of this, that, and the other, and then we'll act. That's the enemy, because the greatest strategist you will ever encounter is within your own head. They know that. No, they don't. It, but who's no, they? No, no, no. That's the point. State, that's state, your greatest enemy right there. No, we fuck yeah, yeah, yeah. ourselves up. The, we don't the need point to. is, though, they're not your enemy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The point is, our belief in feeding that concept of multi-level <laughs> strategic censorship of our action, that's the problem. Fuck all of that. Get up and act and just do it. Screw what you think anybody else is doing or why they think they're doing it. What you feel moved to do in the moment, go and do it and own it and own the moment. And don't go through 57 levels of second guessing strategic censorship before you do. Because I know myself, the last six years of my life I see is virtually wasted because of exactly that. But I'm not, you know, you heard the various levels I'm talking about, right? So I'm talking about getting right up into atomic character and letter. I've been, I've been doing like, like, you know, 20,000 level second guessing strategic manipulative decision making for like the last six years and it's a waste of fucking time, right? Now what I'm about is getting out and acting and just saying, look, here we are, we're having a conversation, I've had a few pints, I might have rambled a bit and all the rest of it, but I hope we've managed to have a connection because this is the difficulty and the struggle that we've got is how do we connect with our fellow human beings, you're my neighbours in different ways, so how do I connect with you and how do we actually say, well, you know, I might not know you dress differently for me, you do it differently for me, but how do we actually get on and be a community because that's the struggle, forget the rest of it, that's all part of the strategic greatest enemy nonsense that we've got going on. And I don't know, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a really funny one, that, and I've been playing with that recently because it's like, that's hilarious. I'm lying there laughing at myself for ages and the amount of wasted time of, yeah, but they, they this and they don't know this. Oh my goodness, look at that. And it's like, you know what, forget it. Because the problem is, what, we're not doing enough basic grassroots action to be able to sit there pontificating like that. Let's get on with some basic stuff first. Yeah, at least a bit of elementary challenge or whatever. Anyway. Next up, if any questions. We've covered the whole universe and back already. Sorry? <laughs> We've covered the universe. <laughs> We've covered the universe. That's it. Yeah. Because it's direction. It. You know, oh, yeah. the way I see it, right, you're talking about evil and good. Yeah. I see it in black and white. Exactly. Left and right, up and down, hot and cold. Let me finish, right. Yeah. You've got a TV set and you can produce black and white pictures on a TV set with three gums. <laughs> you know, and it's the way that you let those three gums work that produces black or white. And you're talking about ideas and all these people with evil on the mind. Well, excuse perception. me, you've not heard me because that's not what I've said No, at all. well, someone said that. I, 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 I just think it's how you let those people manipulate your life. Yeah. Mm. It's about the battle for your internal state, that's what I said. Correct. It's about your reaction. Mm. They can do what they like. You know, I, I, I don't think people yeah. have got evil on the mind. Yeah, I agree. 
I agree. You, you know, it's saying. like if you don't yeah. eat a dog on a, a, yeah. you don't eat a dog on a Tuesday. Tuesday is a good fucking day for that dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. But it's I know all simple. I know what you're saying, and, and I agree with you. The point is, that's why I'm saying, that's why he's challenging me in the fact that I'm not willing to name things like that. It's because I'm not willing to say that there's an individual person sitting there mulling those thoughts. I don't think there is evil. I, I just think there's a lot of dickheads in charge yeah. who want to be yeah. the top management dog. That's why I literally said a product of an apathy. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's why I don't like talking about that. I mean, that's the thing. It's like these terms are too charged. I, I don't think anyone's evil. predominantly yeah. evil. Yeah, I agree. Where I they're agree. going might end up in evil. Yeah, but they go there ignorantly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. it's a process, isn't it? That's why I was talking. That's what those spirals I was talking about earlier are. Is that people start off in one particular way, and then before they know it, they've arrived somewhere that yeah, they don't, they, they didn't expect to get there. We've all done that in our life. We've all gone down streets in our life that ended up places that we didn't really actually want to be in the end. I mean, Back track out. But that, I, hate, I hate to keep harking on, but doesn't it sort of in a way you pre, you're presupposing that there's a blank canvas for us all, and that's you know in a way that there might be a group of people who see themselves as superior and always have done, and, and their blank canvas for their kids is you're the controllers. They never get a choice. We might have a certain level of choice, even though we might not be aware of it, because we're not directly controlled. I we're indirect control, whereas these people that control the agenda from birth have it forced upon them, so they never have a choice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why I mean, that's that's why I talk about all this other stuff. Is because it's all reflections of the various mechanisms and structures we have within ourselves. It's all just extensions of those. It really is. It's nothing more than that. And I think, you know, to give. It just, I don't know, it's just, I'm just not into fantasizing about satanic ritualism in long-term families and all this sort of stuff. I just don't want the thoughts and images in my head in terms of the my co-creating power. I don't want to give that any of my attention. And that's not, I think, I'm getting responsibility for its existence. It's for the fact that I'm acknowledging it's out there, but I'm not giving it any attention. It's like, yeah, I know it's there. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, a, you know, I know the, the fourth brick from the left is over there as well, but I'm not giving that any attention either. And um, uh, this is where I think, again, it comes back to this whole whose world do you want to live in and whose story do you want to repeat and all the rest of it. Well, I am now putting my energy and attention into the one I want to create. I don't give a fuck what they want to do. But until I'm doing that, then I'm, I'm just a fat cell in theirs. Because all I'm doing is sitting there going, yeah, well, they did this. But here, I'm going to go to the bank, I'm going to use the consumer products and all the rest of it. It's like, well, actually, you're a fat cell in their system. That's fine. But you've got absolutely no right to complain unless you're going to actually do something in relation to a, a, something that you've envisaged or a, vi a vision that you buy into in some way. Otherwise, you are buying into their vision. You're part of their reality. Accept it. You might as well. Because I'm all about us actually getting real. Let's get real. Let's be honest. Because unless we can be honest about which reality we're living in, who we're feeding and all the rest of it, it's all a joke, it's farcical. It's like, well, we're, it's, it's hypocritical, not hypocritical nonsense, and, uh, you know, whatever. That's why I, I stopped doing it. The whole reason I got into the free man movement and the sovereign movement was because I saw something real there. I was running events for yoga centres and, and spiritual groups and all the rest of it for years, and it was just faff to me. There was all these people coming along, and it was spiritual escapism I saw. People wanted to escape, they wanted to get away from here. And when you presented them with tools that could help them deal with the real them, they wanted to run. Because people don't want to really face the truth. They want either someone to press a magic button or do something for them or they want to be taken away. They want something to make it all better and go away. And it's like, no, when are you going to accept that you came here? When are you going to accept that the challenges we face are grisly, they're here, they're substantial, they're substantive? I mean, the hurdle you face to make this body get up off the ground. Have you ever seen a baby when they're trying to get up? When they first try and get up, it's all what they think getting up is. There's this namby pamby kicking of the legs, you know. To make your body get up is a primal manoeuvre that none of you know how you do it. Because none of your traditional muscles are used to actually get up. There's this uh, moment to get up. And if you, again, infants are a great example of that. Because you all went through that. And that's what I think we've got to find is that in our daily ownership of our environment. And until we're doing that, the rest of it's irrelevant. Our pontificating about it is irrelevant. It really is just 
getting into the mental masturbation is what I call it. It's a whole bunch of mental mental masturbation. It is. It's loads of self-flagellation about sitting on our ivory tower of our own awakenedness and saying, oh, well, yeah, I'm doing okay, so let's pontificate about the political situation. And it's like, well, actually, mate, you've done 5% if you're lucky. You know, and again, I'm, my, my tongue is loosened in 2012. You know, it really is, because normally this is stuff I veer away from, but the point, you know, there's way too much finger pointing and not enough ownership going on. Um, next one. Anything. So we wrap up. Positive visioning. Positive vision. Own your vision. Have a beautiful vision for your family, for yourself, for your community, for your environment. Just picture something nice on a daily basis. Picture a sense of hope and possibility because, it's not, you know, there's so much doom and gloom and hopelessness and who cares if they're mobilising for a potential world war fear, whatever, that's not actually on your doorstep and you are on your doorstep, which means you can change the amazing variety on your doorstep and do boggle about that, but it doesn't matter. By changing what's on your doorstep, you can have a beautiful reality and trust me, if you do that, everybody else will too. They want to guarantee it. Three dollars. <laughs> Good evening.